It's a Shot in the Arm podcast, and I'm Ben Plumley, your host. This is a podcast about global health and human rights, and particularly how revolutionary change in technology and climate and health can either bring people together or rip societies apart. So this is the first of an informal series of podcasts focused on One Health, an issue I've become more and more obsessed about in the last year. It's the idea that we need a worldwide, multidisciplinary strategy connecting all aspects of healthcare for humans, animals and the environment. Now, a year ago, to kick off our move to video podcasting, we met Professor Jonna Mazet. She's the Executive Director of the University Davis One Health Institute. She's also a board member of the Bay Area Global Alliance, who partners with us in producing these podcasts. Well, a year on, we are meeting Jonna again, as well as her colleague, Professor John Parrish Sproul, who is Director of the Global Health Communication Centre at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Well, you're really going to enjoy reconnecting with Jonna and meeting John. They are both members of the One Health Action Collaborative, the Subcommittee on Public Health, Global Health and Environmental Security, which is part of the Forum on Microbial Threats and the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. Now, I need to say up front that a Shot in the Arm podcast is not in any way affiliated with, funded by or endorsed by the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine. Views expressed by John, Jonna and any other members of the One Health Action Collaborative are purely their own and do not reflect any official or unofficial Academy's reports or recommendations. Well, phew, having that got out of the way, Jonna, welcome back. How are you? Oh, thanks for having me. I'm fine, thankfully, uh, but I, I wish I was in a different room than I was a year ago. So, I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me back. But, uh, uh, you know, we all are looking forward to getting our shots in the arm so we can get right. out of these rooms. And John, welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. How are you doing? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and at least uh, today I'm doing fine, and uh, that's all you can count on, I think, at the moment. <laughs> right. Well, Jonna, in March 2020, you and I got together as the pandemic was kicking off. A year on, <laughs> I don't even know how I can ask this, how do you think we've done? <laughs> uh, well, let me, uh, I like to be as positive as possible to keep my spirits up. I hope a lot of people out there are able to do the same in this incredibly challenging time uh, where everything sort of pushes us down. Um, I, I do think that uh, the beginning of this terrible pandemic uh, set us on a path that was very, very difficult. Um, our slow response uh, and the, the difficult risk communication that we're gonna talk about today uh, I do think that we have moved in a very positive direction. I've been amazed at the way communities have come together to support each other, uh, dismayed by how some of the division uh, has pushed us apart. Uh, but still, I feel very positive about the, the human spirit and uh, tenacity that is bringing us here to talk to you and um, reaching out across disciplinary lines like we like to do with One Health. So thanks for that. Oh, well, it's great to have you back. And and John, uh, talk about multidisciplinary. Can you talk a bit about your background and, and how you got so connected and interested in health and communications? Well, my background, I guess, in some respects seems straightforward to me and complex to everyone else I talk to. Uh, I'm a professor of communication studies, but I take a fairly expansive view of communication, which is a tangential discussion not appropriate here. But the upshot of it is, is that you see communication as something that's systemic and flows through everybody and everything. And we really have to think about how we talk with each other and what we say to each other because it matters and it connects to everything else. 
Uh, as a consequence of that particular perspective, I've worked a lot with the World Health Organization, with various ministries of health and various NGOs in a variety of projects dealing with a number of different diseases and a number of different systems issues and places to try to take what we can do, which is how we engage with each other to improve the quality of healthcare delivery and health itself. And that uh, is, I think, is what brought me here today, because I think when we when we think about One Health, we think about those systemic connections uh, with everything. And I think this way we can begin to link things together in ways that are understandable and useful. And, and, and Jonna, can we can I just take you back to my definition of One Health? Uh, was that right? Um, how is it how is it related to, say, planetary health? So I think of One Health as having two central tenets. One is that we must bring the disciplines together, as you said, that can help us address huge, wicked problems. And so we can't think, I'm an epidemiologist and a veterinarian. I can't just sit and do what I do with data and animal and human uh, information. I need to bring in and partner with people like John and you in communications and social sciences to understand the drivers of um, the problems themselves. The other central tenet is that we need to look at this intersection of human, animal, environmental, and plant health. And um, that is, is very clearly uh, right in the center of what planetary health is. And so if we treat the planet as our patient, we can certainly understand the complexity of that patient and why we need so many uh, different disciplines to come together to work on those problems and hopefully solve them. Instead, we've been working in our ivory towers, mm -hmm. working discipline by discipline, and that hasn't worked. And that's why we're here today. Yeah, and I want to—I really want to come back to that idea of um, ivory towers. Um, John, why do you think the concept of One Health is not more broadly accepted, either in the general population or in the academic community? I, I've been thinking a lot about Ray um, Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near. Do you remember that from 2005? And it was, it was all about how uh, humans are going to transcend biology. We're all going to be cyborgs in some way, <laughs> when really this is all about the fact that we're basically the same thing, humans animal, the planet. Why is it so hard to make the case for One Health? Well, to me, uh, One Health seems obvious. I think to some other folks, maybe not so much. And part of it is, is for several centuries, we have, as John pointed out, put things in silos. And we, and we take what's called a reductionistic approach, which is to say, you look at this part, you look at this part, and you look at this part, and somehow if we put it all together, we'll have an understanding. And what we've realized over the last several decades is that dynamic process between things is where things happen, it's in, and you can't understand that if you keep everything separated in the way that you look at that. And, you know, in a very brief example, there was a study done in the UK uh, a couple of years ago that found that if the healthcare provider puts people in a good mood at the time of a jab, the vaccine itself actually works better in the body. And that's just a hint to suggest that there's a relationship between how that vaccine's working and how we talk with each other. And when you see those kind of linkages and you spread that out, you recognize that One Health is really giving a, pointing us in the direction of what we need to do to try to move beyond the limitations of the way we have approached this for centuries. It's not that it hasn't provided something good for us, but it's also found its own limitations and we need to move beyond that. So, so let me put this um, let me then put vaccines through the grinder of this worldview, if you like. Um, obviously, that's our number one priority at the moment. And we've been very focused, very linear about this. Um, I've been part of advocacy campaigns to raise funding for global COVID efforts. But it's a bit like vaccines or treatment and protection. It, sort of worse, it feels like whack-a-mole. You know, you, you hit one and then you hit the other. Uh, whereas, in fact, COVID has sort of reinforced 
broad elements of unacceptable human behaviour, like violence against girls and women. Uh, is it just the way we are wired to think of things in a linear way? Or what's our challenge in, in, in having um, a more sort of comprehensive view of things? I mean, John, I don't know if you want to, to kick off there. I think when, when you know, the, the problem with linearity is it's seductive. It's so easy to understand A causes B causes C, et cetera. But if you think about your everyday conversation, just as a, as a touchstone, you can have thoughts in your mind about what you're going to do when this podcast is over. You can have thoughts in your minds about your, 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 some other friend or some other activity you're doing while you're engaged in this discussion. And so your mind's not necessarily singularly focused on anything. It's, it's, it's looking at various things, and sometimes the way we discover things is making those conceptual leaps as we have those different things going on in our mind. And so if you have conversations with people, you, that, that's part of what can draw that out if there's some aim to do that. And recognizing that we live in a nonlinear life all the time. It's only when we sometimes try to study things that we impose linearity on it. And yes, we'll find something, but we'll also miss an awful lot when we do that. It's funny that you say that, John. As a mom, I, I'm just thinking about my life on conference calls, talking about science in a linear way while I'm grabbing the kid, trying not to let her burn her hand on the stove and keeping the dog from running away. So yes, we don't live linearly, do we? But we, uh, but we generally, in science, it's been a mistake. We've, we've thought, you know, each discipline thinks it has the answer and can can attack it stepwise. And we're just learning it's it's not the case. Um, I, I mean, John, there's that, there's that old adage that um, women are the superiors of our <laughs> species because uh, women multitask, men can't. Um, and I'm, I, I, I certainly feel that pain. Uh, I have a horribly linear way of viewing of the world. Um, but as you look at it in terms of... Um, epidemiology and say clinical research is it just the way our brain manages things is 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 this how we answer questions that we we can't deal with um multiple disciplines at the same time i i don't think it's the way our brains function as much as i think we've been driven to find answers and the quickest way to find answers is to go to you know succumb to that seduction. I love the way, John, you put that uh, and say, I need to reduce this down to a very small stepwise piece. And then I can add the complexity and see if it holds true. The problem is we reduce it down to that piece. And then most of us are on to the next redu reduced linear path. We rarely actually do bring in that complexity and go to the next level. And when we do, it's, in my opinion, out of the appropriate time sequence. We do it too late because the assumptions that we made when we reduced it down at the beginning may have been wrong because we didn't bring in the disciplines and we didn't bring in the, the nonlinear thought processes at the base when we were designing our process. When, when we were talking about putting this podcast together, John, you said something, I'd love to raise it again, that has really, really sort of stuck with me, that the vaccine efforts, if we weren't careful, were like opening Pandora's box. What did you mean by that? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that for me again, just to make sure I got it? Yeah, when we were preparing for the um, for the podcast, you said that the way the world is responding uh, or or building up the capacity to deliver vaccines as something of a Pandora's box. What did you mean by that? If we are building our capacities to think in terms of complexity and systemic nature, I think that in some ways. We're watching that happen, but we're not doing it with sufficiently sufficient intentionality in, in enough places. And that is quite simply, if we start from the beginning uh, of educational process for people to see things as, as nonlinear and non-complex, and we give them the vocabulary to do that, and we discuss that, and we 
and we recognize that and, and we and we teach problem solving in that particular way and we bring people together in collaborative ways to try to do those kinds of things then then by the time they're uh, 20 22 25 years old that that's inculcated another way of thinking about that is is as we learn what we're developing our patterns of neural firing in our in our brain and 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 so if we substantial if we create those patterns of neural firing so it's instantiated then we'll automatically think in those kinds of ways the difficulty we have now is this linearity and as a way of thinking and as a way of doing thing it's instantiated both in our minds and in our language and so it's it's difficult to escape that both in explanation as well as understanding and and so it would be best if we could start in in other ways and in the specifics of how you might do that K through 16 is is uh, beyond the scope of this discussion, I think. But but I think the idea is, is to recognize that that's learnable and it's a way of thinking and a way of seeing that will automatically uh, impact how people understand and conceptualize problems and then how they try to do to to approach them as practitioners as well as scholars. See, this is fascinating. I've been reflecting on you know, 20, 30 years of HIV prevention medicine, um, uh, communications. And i, I got to say, I, I feel our approach, our approach has been medieval. It's sort of like throwing all sorts of tactics at the wall and seeing what sticks. We really don't know actually what we're doing. But, but what you're saying is that we need to think about this in a more fundamental way biological sense aren't you that that when we change our behaviors or we decide to change our behaviors something changes in us chemically um whether it's in our brain or or, or wherever yeah I, I think that as you look at anything and and you see it in a in a com in a complexity way then you you can see things that that are have in a sense, multiple personalities or multiple uh, possible uses, multiple possible ways of, of approaching that. And you also uh, see, you begin to understand that the world's not linear. So if you think about how, how this the computer works, it's not as if it sends a singular package of our, our picture and our words, and it goes through the line as a single whole and ends up in somebody's uh, uh, terminal. It, 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 it separates and it disperses and it goes all over the place and it comes back together at the end remarkably well. That's somebody who's thinking in a nonlinear way. And what we have to do is to recognize that we need to, to think that way and teach that throughout because that is how we can then begin to understand the relationship between how a virus in a bat somehow ends up in a human and somehow ends up spreading around the world and how all of those things are interconnected and that that's perfectly understandable. And as we understand it in that way, then we can begin to approach those problems with a different set of research questions and a different set of practices that might help us uh, manage these kind of pandemic experiences differently. So so give us an example, John, where where uh, the messaging, the public health messaging has worked? Well, public health messages um, are a mixed bag because when you say where, where they have worked, all public health messages work with somebody. Now, the question is, is what, what percentage of people do they work with? You know, and so when we think about uh, the safe sex commercials for HIV, uh, some people embraced that and took it to heart. Other people totally ignored it. And in the question, and when we think about masking, some people take that to heart and some people intentionally ignore it. And, and so can you say the message uh, uh, was successful or not successful? Well, that's difficult. I mean, in the sense of, did somebody listen to you? Yeah, it was successful. To the extent that a whole bunch of people didn't, no, it's not successful. And so it's a both and. And, and what we recognize then is, well, for some people, we have to say this, and for other people, we have to say that. And we have the technological capability of doing that, but we have to invest in that when we create public health messages. And it's not simply tailoring. It's about recognizing we have to 
to invest in that dialogue. Because if you tell somebody you have to wear a mask and they say, I don't want to. And you say, well, it's really a good idea. Well, why is that? And then you have that discussion. That's different than when you say to somebody, you should wear a mask and they go, okay. Yeah. And, 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 and you have a, and you have a, and so you have to have a, a sense of the complexity of a dialogue rather than a complexity of just a message. And, and just a message is too isolated, too simplistic and too linear. But then how do we measure this? I mean, and, and, and John, or I guess this is a bit of a question for you. I mean, you know, our, our, our clinical, our epidemiological, our public health uh, measurements, monitoring and evaluation has all been around um, sort of A plus B equals C, to put it at its most mm -hmm. simplistic. We have a very linear way of seeing a um, an intervention, then looking at its uh, output and um, uh, outcome, but but this is suggesting that we have to sort of rethink that model. Does does this scare you, or are you or are you saying, yeah, bring it on? Oh, bring it on! I uh, <laughs> I it, you know I'm a funded researcher. We are required, and we even have specialists. And there's a whole body of training around monitoring, evaluation, and learning, and how we. Uh, evaluate metrics. I will say that is changing, but the way most of us are still evaluated is by the numbers. It is absolutely counts, uh, counts of what you delivered, not counts of what was received and taken up. Uh, not success, in my opinion, at all. Uh, and that's, again, because it's easier. It's easier to linearly think about what did I start to do and did I do it and how many times did I do it? Let's count that and check the boxes. Uh, it's not working. Um, and I think just a testament to that, and I, I don't mean to play on the title of your podcast, but just to play on that uh, and as a, a real illustration, um, these vaccines are essential. I do not want to say anything that will keep anyone from getting their shot in the arm. That said, they should have been the last ditch resort. We had to wait. Now, people pulled out all the stops and accelerated the process dramatically and used new technologies that aren't really new but hadn't really been employed before. So we did an amazing thing with those. And again, that's great. But they are not the panacea. The, what we needed was the political will and the communication to trust science, to implement good public health measures from the front so that we didn't even need to get down this road or we could have developed the vaccine, but it wouldn't have been an emergency and everyone maybe didn't need to get it. So uh, we're, we're needing to learn from our mistakes and our mistakes in a large part are the lack of uh, respecting each other, respecting each other's intelligence, and being able to communicate in a way that plays to that. John, I mean, do you, as you look at this last year, um, compare for us China, say, versus the US, has has the virus taking a, taken advantage of the fact that you know, democracies are cacophonies in a sense, and that, you know, there hasn't been an opportunity to um, force, shall I say, a um, a coherent, if sometimes incorrect, but at least a, a simple singular message. You're asking, you know, has the virus changed our way of thinking about this and talking about this? And the answer, I think, is absolutely. Uh, in but in different ways for different people, because we have uh, we have varying degrees of issues and varying and you can see that in the different states' responses to the virus and and what they think they should do and in in some locales people have been very very good about engaging in mitigation behaviors and in other locales people have uh, ignored them completely and and some places are are in between. But, but there's no place that's not talking about it, no matter what position people take about it. And there's probably nothing that has that has been so consistently in the news and so consistently discussed, debated about, uh, and, you know, and created both information, disinformation, and misinformation about uh, as this particular virus and the pandemic. And I think the other thing that's unique about that is, is that 
even though much of our discussion that you see on Facebook and Instagram and so forth is very U.S. centric, it's a global issue. Mm. And you go to every country and the same set of discussions are going on. And, and that's when we recognize, you know, in a One Health sense again, that we need to have a planetary discussion about these because it's not something that the virus doesn't stop at a border and, 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 and it doesn't carry a passport. And, and so I think that, that it, it's, it's a, it's an opportunity for that stage. The final thing I would say about that is, is that it took us a long time for the majority of the people, according to polls, to, to trust science about climate change. And yet here we come to science about the pandemic and we, we find much lower levels of trust about that. Hmm. And so the question is, is, you know, is it going to take us another 10 years to get people to, to trust that? Uh, or is there some way we can link those together and think about those discussions so that we can increase that sense of understanding? And it's not that science has the answers. Science helps us find ways of doing things that are better, and then we incorporate that. And, and, and I think that if we would do that, we would have a very different discussion about science and a very different discussion about the pandemic. And it creates an exigent that allows us or enables us to think about doing that. Do you know, one of the most impactful and powerful comments that Tony Fauci said over the last year, and my God, were there a few, but when he was asked, what happens next? Uh, what happens when, I can't even remember what the question actually was about, but his answer was, we don't know. And I think it's really important for our public health community, and by that I mean our epidemiologists and our, our researchers too, to be able to say, well, look, we don't know yet. This is what we're doing. This is what the research says. Part of our problem, I think, is that we come to this with almost a religious fanaticism that um, science and clinical science particularly is going to be, is going to sort our problems. And, and John, I, you know, from, from your worldview, um, how do you how do you encourage uh, peers in the clinical science environment to uh, how shall I put this uh, continue to have a bit of humility? So humility is important, though I will say some of the disciplines in the health sciences are trained to inspire confidence in their patients. And by that training, they then this is ingrained in actually centuries of training, uh, that you have to be, forgive me, but God-like, so that your patients trust that you are giving them the right information and they are on a path to becoming well or, or whatever the message you're giving them. Uh, that doesn't work in the level of uncertainty that we live. It probably doesn't work in that room with the patient either for a good portion of those patients. Uh, but it and it and it certainly isn't going to work with the generations, uh, millennials and younger, because they are used to information flying at them from all kinds of sources and applying their own filters. And that I think is what we need to understand better to do a better job going forward. The um the humility is key, but it, it also means we need to, as scientists and health professionals, we need to partner with the public. We need to partner and have trust. We need to listen and speak. And the, and the community that we're speaking to needs to understand that that uncertainty means that we have to sometimes say, I don't know, or say, and this is what I try to do. This is the best information we have today. Right. I believe it's taking us in the right direction, but some of this will be wrong. And I, I think that's where, uh, you know, I think Dr. Fauci has been a hero in this whole thing. But you can see where he did say, I don't know, he gets slammed. If he actually used the science and say, this is what we know today, people come back later and take the snippet of the part that was wrong and just play that over and over and hold it against him. So that's what we fear as scientists. So I think the unfortunate consequence is for the most part, that's made us as a, a large community quiet. We speak to each other, but we don't share as well with the public and with the media uh, anything that puts us out on a limb because we don't want to be wrong. I guess I um, I 
try to inspire in my students the ability to be okay with being wrong, because that's the only Mm. thing that's going to drive us forward. Do you know, it reminds me of the the lessons that we haven't learned from the AIDS movement. Um, And, you know, here I'm I'm really aging myself. But going back to the late uh, 1980s and 1990s, you know, the whole point was that the physicians, the infectious disease specialists, didn't know we were likely to know as much, if not more, than they were. And it was our job to educate ourselves. And sometimes we got that right. A lot of times we got that wrong. Um, John, again, do you think there are um, ways in which, with this um, explosion of of information that is available to us, that we can be much more informed um, patient leaders, uh, consumers of healthcare. Well, one of the things we first of all have to recognize is is that you know information and and communication again are not linear. So we don't get to decide what somebody chooses to believe as information, disinformation, or misinformation. And so we can feel like we're putting out information and they can say, yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't believe that. And, 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 we, and we could say something that, that makes no sense at all to a scientist. They'll go, okay, yeah, I'll accept that one. That, that's a good one. And, and, and those things get tied up into our hopes, fears, concerns, other conversations we've had, other beliefs, etc. So part of the difficulty, first of all, is recognizing it's, it's a messy conversation. We're not going to just go out and convince people to believe in science and convince people that, that scientists are humans and they they do the best they can, but they don't know everything, etc. And we also can't convince people to uh, to approach with a a reasonable skepticism. So I mean, look how long it's it, it has taken us to try to get people to say, get a second opinion. You get a diagnosis or something, get a second opinion. Why? Not because your doctor's incompetent, but because we just want to make sure and because there's a possibility there's wrong because they, you know, practicing medicine is an, I always say, is an art platformed on science. And and so, you know, you, you've got to you've got to think about that mix. And so we have to, to learn to have a more sophisticated conversation with people. And, it, and, and it's not to say that people are unsophisticated, but we usually want to straight give me the answer and I'll do it, you know, and, and I think that's why people like the comfort of saying, just give me a prescription and then I'll be fine. And mm-hmm. we know that that's not a good way to practice good health for, for many, many things. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a recognizing that we have to have different conversations about that in our schools, in our, in our homes, on television, and, and for people to be able to situate science as a way of thinking, as a way of knowing in that. Because the reality is, Everybody believes in science once in a while, like when they get in their car or they get on an airplane. They, the, the science that goes into making those things work, they have faith in. And then suddenly you say, yeah, okay, I want you to get the jab. And they go, no, I don't, I don't believe that science. And, 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 and so there's a, a you know, science of decisions of convenience. And we need to understand that better and talk with people and find that out. Uh, and, I, and I think that we, we have not historically done that particularly well. The, the science of convenience, the convenience of science. I love that. I, I wanted I wanted to broaden the concept of one health as well, if I if I might. Um, Jonna, you're a veterinarian, and we're, we're we're all farm to table at the moment. But I don't get the sense that well, particularly out here on the west coast, we're all farm to table. Whether we do it or not is another matter. But we, we, we're we not making the connections that all of this is somehow linked to health, the water, the food, the, the pathogen transmission. And I am I wonder, do you think we have done enough to bring in environmentalists into our discussion? Uh, or do you feel that that is um, a, a huge gap? I do think it's a gap, but I, I think it's an opportunity. Uh, honestly, I my base, as we talked about last time, I came uh, uh, into this career in emerging viruses and public health from a conservation perspective. I was trying to save wildlife species. And uh, that brought me to understand 
that the things that I was looking at and seeing in threatened and endangered wildlife were the same things that were uh, aging myself as well, uh, killing friends and family members that were infected with HIV AIDS because mm -hmm. we were all susceptible when our systems were broken down to the same things. And those things were driven by human behavior and changes to our built environment. Um, so pathogens were flowing from human communities into the sea, infecting the seafood that the animals in the sea, the people who enjoy seafood were all eating and getting the same diseases. And I think that that really changed my mindset to realize that the drivers for these huge, wicked problems that we say are facing as a global society are the same. And it's not a pleasant concept, but it's if we raise a mirror, that's where the problem lies. It's how we are behaving on this planet. So viruses and the hosts like bats that have those viruses do not leap out and attack us. We put ourselves at risk by the way that we are behaving on the planet. And that risk that we are inspiring that is a heavy footprint on how we use the earth is the same driving force behind other huge problems like climate change, uh, like toxins in our environment. And I think if we come together as like-minded communities that want to, if you forgive me, save the world, uh, that's the people and the actual planet we depend on, uh, we would be in a much, much better place. It is hard to attack every single faction, as John mentioned. Everybody needs to hear a message in a different way. But if we find some unifying concepts that actually are scientifically unified and matter about the future of the next generations and our planet, I think we can uh, do a lot better. And I think of those uh, photographs of birds being caught up in face masks that have just been discarded as a, a real example of 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 how we we're not thinking of this in a, a holistic way. John, I, I got a question for you. It's just reflecting on what Jonna has said. Um, I think of the oh, I'm going to regret saying this, the sort of smart ass NPHs from both coasts of the US who who say say things like the thing to do is to eliminate mosquitoes or eliminate bats and then we've got rid of the problem but this seems hugely irresponsible and and simplistic what do you think is the is the sort of the driver of that thinking and 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 how do we how do we move on from that i think uh, and I hope they answer this well. The, 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 I think the issue is, is, and it's very much the, the point that, that Jonna was making, is, is recognizing that everything is interconnected and everything is in motion. And, and to focus on the, that dynamic motion so that a virus isn't, you know, our bodies aren't just a thing. They're actually porous and pretty engaged with all kinds of, of uh, 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 micro species as well as macro species. That's, and so we, we've, I'm fascinated by the research that shows our microbiome may well be uh, related to uh, autism or it may well be related to obesity and all of those kinds of things that we spend a lot of money, time, and angst on. And it has something to do with, with little tiny microscopic uh, critters that are living in us and on us, and 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 to and so as we start thinking about ourselves as both individuals and connected to everyone else, that 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 brain waves between a mother and an infant can sync within a couple of minutes, and and that we do that with people around us as well, and to get that we are yes we're individuals, but we're also highly interconnected. And that it's not either or, it's a both and. And if we understand that, then when we wear a mask, it makes more sense to recognize I'm both protecting myself and I'm protecting you, which also then in turn protects me more and, and it's helpful. Because if we uh, if we took the example of Taiwan, where everybody wore a mask and did social distancing, they didn't close down their their uh, their economy, and they've had, I think, seven deaths since the inception of all of this, and they have 23 million people. 
Why? Because they recognized that both and because they got beat up in the SARS uh, uh, epidemic a, a little over a decade ago. And so, and so you, you get that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not just being kind and being respectful, although those things are really good. It's recognizing that what I do that's good for you is also good for me, and what you do is good for me is also good for you, etc., and that there's a, a mutuality in that. And that doesn't deny us as individuals, but it also recognizes that we are not truly isolated uh, despite the sort of overt large appearance that we're separate entities. We're really highly connected. So here we are, uh, early 2021, We've, we're moving slightly away from health nationalism and the, the focus on the, the nation state to a more connected future, Touchwood. Where do you both see things going from here? Uh, Jonna, when, when you and I connect next year for our annual podcast, what will you hope you'll be saying? <laughs> I hope we'll be in the same room. That's what I really hope. <laughs> um, and maybe even we can have a little cheers afterwards, right? Uh, out in public. That's, uh, that's I think, what we're, we all, back to John's point, we all want certain things. Finding those things that we all want and helping people to understand how we get there is critically important. Right now, I uh, I don't want to be a naysayer, but I am concerned that the way that we are dealing with the recovery, uh, moving towards recovery of this pandemic is is not necessarily going to be quick. And I say that because I'm dismayed by the inequities uh, and I understand them, uh, where they're coming from as far as how we are uh you know, distributing vaccine, not only in this country, but also maybe as importantly uh, outside of this country. So if we look at the amount of vaccine, for example, that's making its way to Africa um, and uh, looking at the number of people that need to be vaccinated and they likely won't be vaccinated for a year after I get vaccinated, that dismays me. And I'll use John's uh, analogy both for for them and for me. Because if they don't get vaccine and new strains evolve that make my vaccine ineffective, I am still going to be in the same situation that I am in today. So we really need to figure this out. And I understand that people are not going to say, hey, my tax dollars went to pay for that vaccine. I should get it first. I understand that. And I'm not saying that that is wrong. I'm just saying that you and have to think about, though, the way that that impacts you might keep you in a mask longer than uh, if you were to think about it more holistically. Yes. Uh, and not just vaccines, but but therapeutics as well. We've we've got so much to be doing there. Uh, John, your your sense of the coming year well, I would echo a lot of the things that John has said, and, I, and I'm deeply concerned about um, how rapidly we can vaccinate the global population because that's the only way the global population is, is protected. But the other thing that I, I would add to that is, is that we have a tendency once the crisis moment is passed to say, oh, yeah, that was then, this is now when to move on and not, and not take advantage of lessons learned. And, and I think that going back to our conversations about science and, and the connection of pandemics and, and climate change and, and the changes on our planet is, is that I, I hope that this uh, we don't lose that dialogue and that we build on it and that people recognize that uh, that when we choose uh, solar panels or wind energy, um, that has some impact on uh, species development and, and that in turn may well impact zoonotic diseases and we may well make a difference when we get our next potential pandemic, et cetera, that all of these things are interconnected and that we don't lose that dialogue because, well, now we're all vaccinated, that's passed. And that would be a tragedy if we did that because we're simply setting ourselves up for the next fall if we do that. And, and I think that would be really, really unfortunate. So... On the positive side, always trying a healthier planet makes a healthier us. And uh, if we can if we can recognize that and work together towards that goal, uh, I will 
be so thrilled to be with you to talk about those successes in a nonlinear way next year. Yeah. Well, I will hold you to that and and uh, and you, John, and hopefully we can do this in a year's time in person with a glass of something very nice in our hands as well. <laughs> that would so, be beautiful. <laughs> so, John and John, thank you so, so much. It, it's been a real privilege to have you um, on the podcast. John, you, you're already a shot in the arm. Um, yeah. And John, you have now joined our elite cohort of shot arm podcasters. So thank you both very, very much. Thank you. It's my thank honor. You. And yeah, thanks for the communications. And let's do it. So thanks to Jonna and John. Thanks to Eric Espera, our director, producer from Newsdoc Media. Thanks to Charlie Minichucci from the National Academies. Thanks to Sarah Anderson from the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. And thanks to our executive producer, Sean Howell. By the way, a huge thank you to Prince Huxley or Mr. Peabody, our Jack Russell, who has behaved exceptionally throughout this podcast by sleeping throughout. So it just remains for me to say to you, if you have any questions or suggestions about this or any other of our shows, don't hesitate to contact us through Facebook or Twitter at Shot Arm Podcast. And if you'd like to, we'd love it if you'd give us a five stars and leave us a review on Google Play or Apple Podcasts. That helps us spread the word. Have a great week and a safe week, everyone.